Lecture 7, Solid Separations. The objectives of this lecture are to introduce the separation of solids. Introduce some equipment types that can be used to separate solids. And to show how we can design gravity settlers. Suspended solids present in a liquid that have a de density greater than that of a liquid tend to settle in the liquid by gravity as soon as any turbulent flow within the liquid is removed. The area in which the flow is retarded is called the settling tank. In solid liquid separation processes, a suspension is generally separated into two phases. A clarified supernatant leaving the top of the sedima sedimentation tank or the overflow. So this is our liquid with low concentrations of any suspended solid particles in it. <coughs> and the concentrated sludge leaving the bottom of the sedimentation tank or underflow. And this is our highly concentrated solid particles uh, with potentially some of the liquid still with them. The purpose of settling is to remove a coarse dispersed phase or remove a coagulated or flocculated impurities in a liquid phase, can remove precipitated impurities after chemical treatment, or we can settle sludge, potentially biomass, after an activated sludge process. Gravity settling is used a lot in the treatment of wastewater. There are four generic types of settling. These are type 1, which is discrete particle settling, where the particles tend to settle individually without any interaction with neighbouring particles. This tends to happen only for very dilute systems. Type 2 settling, or flocculent particles, so flocculation causes particles to stick together and they essentially increase in mass as they settle, thus they start to settle at a faster rate. Type 3 settling is a hindered or zone settling where the mass of particles tends to settle as a unit uh, with individual particles remaining in a fixed position with respect to each other. And type 4 settling is a from compressive settling where the concentration of particles is so high that sedimentation can only occur through the structure being compacted by the weight of the particles above. Many solid separation processes just use settling under gravity. However, this can be very slow if you have small particles or small density differences between the particles and the fluid or a fluid of very high viscosity. If this is the case, settling can be improved by substituting centrifugal acceleration for gravity acceleration. So key devices for this are either a centrifuge separator or a cyclone separator. The complicating factors for these enhanced separators are that the centrifugal force depends on the distance from the axis of rotation so as your material is settling, the centrifugal force changes. It also depends on the complex geometry and flow patterns that occur inside centrifugal and cyclone devices. The concentration of particles may also be high so that we have to take into account any hindered settling. But because cyclones are inexpensive and durable and have a good efficiency for collecting particles larger than about 5 micrometers. They are, most wild, they are the most widely used devices for industrial dust collection. Gravity separators work by allowing settling to occur just under gravitational force based on the differences in densities of the materials. The particles can be either a liquid or a solid and the fluid can be either gas or liquid. The most common version of gravity separators are sedimentation tanks. 
Sedimentation tanks may function either intermittently as a batch process or continuously. In the intermittent style tanks, water is added into the tank and held at a complete rest for a certain period of time. After this period of time, the water is then removed from the tank. In a continuous flow type tank, the flow velocity is reduced, but the water is not brought to a complete rest, as in the intermittent type. However, the flow velocity is very low, and no, so there's no turbulence within the liquid to make sure that settling can occur. Settling bas basins can either be long rectangular design or a circular design in plan. Long rectangular basins tend to be much more hydraulically stable than the circular basins. They also allow much better flow control when in very large volumes. Typically, long rectangular separators can have lengths up to 90 meters, where their length ranges from about two to four times their width, and the depths can be up to five meters. The bottom of the rectangular basins are slightly sloped, which allows scraping of the sludge, so you would scrape the sludge down the slope so that it can be collected. This is often done by a slow-moving mechanical scraper that continuously pulls the settled material into a hopper where it can be pumped out. So we can see a diagram of a rectangular gravity separator. The top image is a view from the side and the bottom image is a plan view. So typically gravity separators are divided into four key regions. The first of these regions is the inlet zone. This is the region in which the flow entering from the inlet pipe is distributed over the whole cross-section of the vessel so that the flow through the, through the settling zone of the vessel has a horizontal path with very little turbulence. This zone might contain a selection of baffles to help distribute the flow and the solid material. The second zone is the settling zone. And this is the major zone within our gravity separator. And this is the area in which the settling occurs under the very low flow rate of a liquid. The third zone is the outlet zone. And this is where the clarified effluent is collected and discharged through the outlet weir. The final zone is the sludge zone, and this is the area where the sludge collects, and it's below the settling zone. So this is where the mechanical scraper would come in to scrape the material down the slope from the right hand side to the left hand side, and then it's discharged through the sludge outlet pipe. So last year in solid fluid systems, you looked at the settling of particles. So as a quick recap, you saw that for a force balance on the settling particle, the weight of the particle has to be equal to the buoyancy force of the water plus a drag force for the particle passing through the liquid. This equation could be rearranged to give a term for the terminal velocity of that particle as a function of the particle diameter the density difference between the particle and the fluid and the drag coefficient for the regime of settling that you're in. There are three key regimes. The first is at very low Reynolds numbers, less than about two, which is the laminar or Stokes law regime, where the drag coefficient is given by 24 divided by the Reynolds number, which means you get uh, Stokes' Law's expression for the terminal velocity. The intermediate regime goes from a Reynolds number of about 2 up to about 500. And in this case, the drag coefficient is dependent on the Reynolds number to the minus 0 0.6. And then there's 
a more turbulent style regime where the drag coefficient is essentially a constant. In a concentrated mixture, particles can interact with each other and you get hindered settling. Also, flocculating agents can be added so that it causes the particles to form flocks because flocks settle more quickly than individual particles. So you can account for hindered settling using the richardson zach correlation where US is the settling velocity of the particles. Epsilon is the volume fraction of the continuous phase and UT is our single particle terminal velocity. And then there's an exponential value which changes depending on the regime you're in. But for the Stokes law regime, it's about 4.8. The average velocity across a gravity separator vessel can be calculated from the volumetric flow rate divided by the height of the vessel and the width of the vessel. This means that the transit time or the hydraulic retention time within the separator can be given by the length of the separator divided by this velocity which is equivalent to the volume of the separator divided by the volumetric flow rate. If a particle settles with its terminal full velocity the height that the particle falls over the length of the settl settler is given by this terminal velocity times by the hydraulic retention time or the ratio of the terminal velocity to the velocity of the material flowing through the separator times by the length of the separator. So if this vertical fall height is longer than the settler depth then the particles hit the bottom of the settler before the end of the tank and thus are collected by our gravity separator. If this fall height is less than the height of our gravity separator then the particles may not hit the bottom depending on their entrance level into the separator. This means that some particles have the potential to escape with the outflow. This leads to a definition of a critical settling speed. Mainly, this is the speed that the particles just touch the bottom of the separator, i.e. the fall height is equal to the height of our separator. For this, the critical settling speed is equal to the height of our settler divided by the length of our settler times by our velocity of flowing liquid which is the volumetric flow rate divided by the height and the width of our separator which is equal to the volumetric flow rate of our separator divided by the width of our separator and the length of our separator. So this critical speed is called the overflow rate and you can see that in this definition the volumetric flow rate is not divided by the cross-sectional area but it's divided by the footprint of the tank. We can also define a collection efficiency so if the particles settle with a speed faster than the critical settling speed they'll all be collected and, and the collection efficiency is 1 or 100% for particles settling with a speed lower than the critical velocity, the collection efficiency is given by the ratio of the terminal settling velocity to this critical speed and will always be less than 1. As centrifuges can increase the rate of sedimentation as they replace the acceleration due to gravity with a centrifugal acceleration. They're particularly useful 
when particles are very small, the liquid is very viscous, or the density difference between the particles and the liquid are very small. So situations that would take a very long time for sedimentation to occur in a gravity settler. There are two general types of centrifuges. These are a sedimentation centrifuge where the solid material is just sedimented to the sides of the centrifuge and then are collected, or filtering centrifuges where the solid material is actually stopped by the filter and it's the liquid that passes through the filter to the outside of the centrifuge. A common device for a centrifuge is a tubular bowl centrifuge where the solid material moves to the wall and forms a sludge. The key variables for designing this type of centrifuge are the rotational speed, the distance from the center to the surface of the sludge, and the distance from the center to the inner wall of the, of the tube. Normally, the feed enters at the bottom, and then the liquid exits at the top of a centrifuge. As particles are often very small for centrifuges, we can often assume that we have unhindered settling that obeys Stokes' law. For the centrifuge, we replace the acceleration due to gravity by the centrifugal acceleration, the radius, times by the rotational speed squared. We can also get the velocity of the liquid in the upwards direction, which is given by the flow rate of our material divided by the area that is available for flow. This now gives us two equations. One for the change of position of the particle in the radius of a centrifuge with respect to time, and one for the position of the particle at the height of the centrifuge with respect to time. Therefore, we can combine these two equations to give us an expression for the particle trajectory i.e. the change of position in the radius of a centrifuge with the change in height of a centrifuge. If we design our centrifuge so that at our exit, i.e. the length of the centrifuge, which we've called L, the particle just settles on the inside wall of a centrifuge, R0. This means that we can integrate between this position and the initial position of the particle at the bottom of the centrifuge, z equals zero, which is the radius of the height of the sludge, which is r1. Upon integrating, this can be rearranged for the flow rate of material entering the centrifuge. And you can see that that is given by Stokes' law, which is the first term on the right-hand side of the equation, and then parameters due to the size and dimensions of the centrifuge, which is the second term on the right-hand side. These terms are often lumped together like this, so you can write <coughs> the flow rate as Stokes' Law's terminal settling velocity times by what's called the sigma factor. The reason this is done is so that if you have a known flow rate of material that you want separated, which we can call QA, and you know that for that given system you have a centrifuge that does carries out the separation you want with sigma factor sigma a and you have a larger centrifuge which has a factor of sigma b you can calculate the volumetric flow rate that you can now achieve the same separation for 
by using the ratio of those sigma factors. The main assumptions that we've used for this sigma theory are that the particles are evenly distributed in the continuous liquid and the concentrations of particles are low so that the settling is not hindered. We've also assumed that we've got streamlined flow at low Reynolds numbers so that the rotating liquid is actually rotating at the same velocity as the centrifuge bowl. And we've also assumed that we've got no re-entrainment or displacement of the particles by the flow pattern. A well-designed cyclone can separate liquid droplets as small as 10 micrometers from a stream of air. Small cyclones tend to be more efficient than large ones and it's possible to generate forces 2,500 times that of gravity. For cyclones, the effect of the feed and the device is very complex and there's lots of interdependencies between these two. In cyclones, larger particles tend to move to the wall quite quickly but the smaller particles are only separated from the gas stream near the bottom of the cyclone, often where the gas reverses its direction. Due to the complicated nature of cyclones and that designing one from scratch would actually need very complicated computational flow dynamic simulations, a number of design methods have been based on particle collection efficiencies. So generally, to design cyclones, we have some rules based on a standard cyclone diameter and known geometric ratios that allow us to either scale up or scale down. And this design methodology is the same for either solid liquid, solid gas, or liquid gas systems. One of the most common procedures used to design cyclones is Stearman's design procedure. So to do this, you first pick one of the standard designs for a cyclone. Either the high efficiency cyclone that, although can only handle lower flow rates, has a much greater efficiency of collecting the particles or if you have a larger volumetric flow rate and collecting the smaller particles is not your primary concern you can pick the high throughput design so after you've decided if you want the high efficiency or the high throughput design you look at your particle size distribution for the feed and collect this data. You then look at your inlet volumetric flow rate and try and estimate the number of cyclones in parallel that might be required to get a cyclone diameter for an inlet velocity of between 9 and 27 meters per second and generally you try and stay as close to the optimum inlet ve velocity of 15 meters per second as possible. You then use the standard design to scale the other dimensions of the cyclone. Now that you've picked the number of cyclones needed and found all the dimensions, you can look at the overall collection efficiency versus the particle size for each of the distant types of cyclones. The one on the left is for the high efficiency cyclone and we can see that at the lower particle sizes the percent of particles collected is much higher than for the high throughput cyclone which is on the right hand side. You can then transform the standard curve into the curve for your particular cyclone using the following scaling equation which looks at the ratio of the diameters of the cyclones used.
the ratio of the flow rates, the ratio of the density differences between your particles and the fluid, and the ratio between the viscosities of the fluids used in a standard and your cyclone. So as this is quite a complicated procedure, we're looking at an example. So what we've done is we've picked our standard high throughput cyclone. And the standard dimensions for these is that our diameter is 203 millimeters and the flow rate that the efficiency curve was taken at is 669 meters cubed per hour where the density difference is 2,000 kilograms per meter cubed and the viscosity of the continuous phase is 0.018 millipascal seconds. So if we look at our, our standard high throughput cyclone, we can see that we have a wraparound inlet and we're given that the dimensions of this are 0.75 times our standard diameter by 0.375 times our standard diameter. So we can calculate the area of this inlet, which from our volumetric flow rate allows us to see that for the standard design, the inlet velocity is 16 meters per second. So now for our new design, what we want to do is we're going to design a cyclone for exactly the same materials, but we want to double the volumetric flow rate. So we still want our inlet velocity to be 60 meters per second. And to get this value, we've doubled the volumetric flow rate. We now need our standard diameter to be 287 millimeters. Now we have these parameters, we can put them into our standard scalar expression where we can see that the collection efficiency for a particle of diameter D1 in our standard cyclone design, that same efficiency occurs at the slightly larger particle size of D2. So if we put our parameters into this equation, we get that that scale up is 1.189. So we take our standard high throughput efficiency curve and in this case we take a particle size of 5 micrometers and we can read off the graph and see that 48% of the time this particle is collected. So we use our scale up to find that in our in our cyclone, the same efficiency occurs when the particle size is 5.95 micrometers. So we can then plot this on our updated efficiency curve. We can then repeat this procedure for a sample of particle sizes across the whole efficiency curve to generate the complete efficiency curve for our cyclone. So this example shows the fact that just by increasing the cyclone size to cope with increasing the volumetric flow rate of our input stream, we actually reduce the collection efficiency of our cyclone. So now that we have the collection efficiency curve for our particular cyclone, we can calculate the cyclone performance and the recovery of all the particles for our particular inlet distribution. If the results are unsatisfactory, what we need to do is use a smaller cyclone diameter. So we need to add more cyclones. So in our example case, if we needed the same efficiency as the standard designed cyclone, 
we would have had to have used two cyclones in parallel. When you have this information, you can calculate the pressure drop through the cyclone using the correlation at the bottom of the slide. So, we were introduced to different solid separations equipment and we had a reminder of the terminal settling velocity for solid particles. We then saw how to design a gravity settler based on the terminal settling velocity of our particles. 